it's not all like roses and sunshine. I mean, like it, it's, it's not you, always glamorous. You know, and if the human part's not there, mm -hmm. I fear there's like vocational train wrecks in every walk of life. We'll change the culture when your grandkids are Catholic. But no one's gonna pass this on in a way that they really want to joyfully, enthusiastically replicate this unless we get that human part right. Hey everyone, welcome to the Catholic Link Show. We're your hosts, Drew and Katie Taylor. And today we have Dr. Andrew and Sarah Swafford back on the show yes. uh, to talk about their new book, Gift and Grit, which we really enjoyed. And so we are just going to jump in, um, talking about all about relationships. Uh, and so the first question that I want to ask you guys mm. is, uh, what keeps you guys busy these days? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> you know what? I just love when people are like, yeah, I'm just trying to fill my days. I'm like, I can fill your days. Come on <laughs> over. I have some things for you to do and to help me with. So, yeah, it's been wild, not going to lie. Um, we are in a season that's really fun. But also, we had we, we had a very rare date night the other night. And we were like, man, this is kind of wild in the sense of our oldest is 17, and our youngest is um, three three months. Avila, you know, turned three months, and so it is like a lot of experienced parents have told us that it is wild for like teens to toddlers, and then also like everybody's in the house still, which is oh my heart makes my heart so happy. Um, and then I also look at my fridge, and I'm like, I just filled you. <laughs> like I look at my life, and this I true. I love that. Um, that that mean it's like your brain feels like you have 47 tabs open and you don't know where the heck the music's coming from like that's my life so it's beautiful and it's awesome we are we are loving it um yeah. but summer was we we were made for summer we were made for vacation and then the school starts again and we start all back and we're just like we were not made for transitioning back into school but anyway we we love it it's always a little bit of a wild ride. Yeah, it's full but fun and, um, you know, yes. it's a special season because you know it's not going to last forever. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to see kids turn with, you know, the tour 17, 16, and that's a lot of fun. But you also know that they're kind of we're coming to the end of a journey here and uh, just kind of soaking it in. But it's uh, it's full, though. <laughs> yeah, we're, you're a parent forever, but there is a launching of your kids to college, which is really cool. And we, we walk with a lot of people that do that, so we kind of know what's coming. Um, so... We're ready for it, but yeah, yeah, it's a it's some crazy fun days. We'll put it that you way. You know, it was fun. They they uh, our two oldest ones. They uh, read a pre version of the book before we submitted it to Ascension. So it's kind of fun to have their get their input, uh, yeah. be able to kind of talk about you know big ideas with them and mm -hmm. uh, get, get their reactions and stuff. like the that. The funniest so. was we we saw their notes and it was like uh, in the column in like in the side margin and be like that was totally mom. That was totally dead. <laughs> I don't know who this is. Good job, mom and dad. Yes, it was funny. Yeah. They knew they could they could tell who yeah. was who, but some people have been like, no, like it's really blended well. So, uh, so yeah, there are parts that are blended, and there's parts where it's like that was obviously one of us. So yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we started with that question because I do in the book you guys give it as a recommendation of how to ask people mm. about themselves. And I think often in our culture, it's that like, oh, you know, do as a stay-at-home mom of four kids who's homeschooling, who's doing all these things, who values all of that, it is hard. And it's like, what do you do? <laughs> and I like support you if you stay at home, but how do I learn more about you? And so like, I loved that idea being incorporated in that of it gives you the freedom to share What's going on in your life right now? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, so we uh, we love the book, by the way. I th there were so many good points, and I, I love doing these interviews because it's, it's super fruitful for us because mm -hmm. we get to talk about these stuff. Um, and we, you know, we we, min we minister to young adults as well. And there are some pieces that uh, you're you're trying to to listen and to give advice the best you can. And sometimes I come back and I'm like, I don't even know if any of that made sense. <laughs> Hopefully, God will take that and be helpful. But um, so I, I wanted to ask you guys instead of asking like. Why did you write the book? I want to ask, was there a moment? What, what did it feel like when you decided that you needed to write this book? Was it like exciting? Was it like slightly depressing? Like, ah, yep, we need to write this book. <laughs> like, what, I don't know. T talk us through that. Oh, that's, oh, that's, a, a, that's, a, great that's a great question. You can go first. Uh, I mean, it, it probably was percolating for a while, but I, the... Uh, oh, the, percolating, great word. Well, as we talk about um, that spring of 2018, when I taught in Florence and we, we spent the whole semester in Florence, Italy with 48 
Benedictine college students. And like, really, I mean, we've been with them for a long time. We'd have students over, but to really like live with them for three months and have every meal together and go on trips. And, uh, and it was, a, I mean, a, a life changing trip, uh, lots of conversions and taught the class on JP2 and took a group of them over the, over to Krakow and relived the story on site. But I think that was, I mean, it had been brewing, but in, in the success of your first book, Emotional Virtue, um, but I think what became, so, you know, someone described our book recently to us and I'm like that you nailed it. They said, this is like the Bible of human formation. So it's like, it's about relationships, but it's, it's really about, it's about relationships. But it's also getting that human part, right. Which becomes kind of like the seedbed for faith and for relationships and for all kinds of things. Mm. Uh, and so I, I think the need for that was already apparent to us, but COVID. And we had, you know, COVID amplified that we had great students in Florence. But it was just, it was clear that even like devout students and all over the map, like everybody needs this human formation. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes, and again, uh, our students are amazing, but sometimes the gap there, the lack of that can be covered up with like a lot of piety and devotions. And, we call and, it Catholic frosting, which is mm-hmm. awesome. You know, it's, we and, love and, Catholic frosting. We've all been there. Like you get, you, you grow up and you get married and you, you, or you commit to a vocation of a priesthood or something like that. Like, it's not all like roses and sunshine. I mean, like it's, it's not you, always glamorous. You know, and if the human part's not there, mm-hmm. I fear that there's like vocational train wrecks in every walk of life waiting to happen. If we don't mm-hmm. get this part right to sustain it. And maybe to kind of cap it off, I, you know, a priest friend said this, he's like, we'll change the culture when your grandkids are Catholic. Like when you pass it on where your kids have enough joy that they like want to replicate it. It's like, if we don't get the human part, right, we might like give the right answers. We might even may, maybe make it a generation, but no one's going to pass this on in a way that they really want to joyfully, enthusiastically replicate this unless we get that human part right. So I think that's kind of where yeah. it really came from. Well, we were also seeing, so everything he just said, and then it was, it was interesting, like during COVID, we actually talked about this a lot during a lot. I, I joked that um, it was kind of our COVID baby, but then we started laughing because we were like, well, actually we didn't write it during COVID. We wrote it after COVID and it was brewing inside of us of, of one. Well, we get asked a lot, like, I wish you could bottle what you do at your house around your Island. Or I wish you could bottle what we did. And that's how emotional it, virtue happened. Yeah. Emotional virtue was because I couldn't go to coffee one-on-one anymore. Cause I had too many kids and mm-hmm. it was just like, it was wild. I couldn't do a lot of one-on-one ministry anymore. And Jason Everett was like, this is like, you know, feminine genius. Yo, you've got to start writing this down because you're not going to be able to be everywhere. And it really hit me like, no, I'm not. I'm not going to be able to have this conversation one-on-one like I wanted. So then it was like, okay, if this is helpful, I'll write it down and, you know, please like share it with your girlfriend, share it with your friends, share it with your guy friends. Um, so that's really, this book was like, okay, we cannot, we really want to be with like every young adult that wants to go to, to dinner or we want to be able to jump into the, you know, Bible studies and like, it share this like formation piece. Um, so the book is, is an easier way to do that. But we also, it was very hard to write because it isn't a, um, it isn't like a devotional on Lent and it isn't like a, I mean, it isn't like a real clear, like what I'm doing here. It was very much, you know, no one wants to be told what to do. No one, especially someone that is a young adult trying to navigate it on their own. And so, but then, but then we had all these young adults, like, tell me what to do. Like, I need a fingerprint drawing for crying out loud. Like, I, I don't know how to flirt. I don't know how to talk to people anymore. I don't know how to, you know, the, the joke was, yeah, don't tell me what to do, but give me specifics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so the tone, like we really, we spent, we spent hours like massaging this book out to make sure that the tone was right, to make sure that it was loving and that it was approachable. Cause that's how we are in person. Like, we love you, we love you, we love you, we love you, tough stuff. We love you, we love you, we love you, we love you. Like, you know, you're, we're proud of you, we're proud of you, tough stuff. We're so proud of you, this is hard. You know, I mean, so we really worked really hard to make the book something where they felt like we were talking and hanging out. Um, and that's really hard to do in print. Uh, so that was something that we knew it was time because we were getting so many people asking us like, man, like, what do I do? And and the, the confusion, the pain, the hurt, the isolation, the Fear, the tiredness, the hollowness, it's so real. It is palpable right now. And so this was kind of our like, man, it's got to go somewhere. We've got to put it somewhere. Yeah. I, oh, there's so much there on 
just the idea of that passing it on. And I think that I live in this fear of like the swinging back and forth, like, oh, the pendulum has swung super Catholic. The pendulum is no faith at all. You know, and this reality of you want the formation to be strong enough to pass it on to the next generation. And what a gift that is. I think one of the ways that I described this book was it is a book that teaches you how to go all in for the Lord practically. Because mm-hmm. I think we like we say, oh, I want to run towards the Lord. I do that by going to daily mass. I do that by praying the rosary. I do that by, but like, okay, practically though, how do I have that go beyond that 30 minute or hour mass? How do I take that into every relationship that I have, into my habits, into my prayer life, like you guys actually breaking out prayer in a way that can answer, how how do I pray? I question. And I think that this is a book that every young adult uh, needs, everyone who's discerning their vocation really needs, uh, that this is the foundation. I, I love that idea of just the human formation to prepare you to live out the vocation to then join the road to sanctification because that's what our vocation is, is this road to sanctification. Uh, It is our process of being, oh yes, challenged in a a gift through that sacrifice uh, to then grow. But if we haven't had that strong formation and we look at our vocation is the, like, this is the happy ever after, like, ooh, like, no, no, like, it's a continuation of this human formation. And so thank you for putting into words so much of the advice. Uh, you guys, your 10 years of expertise and massaging that language, it was very readable. Uh, you have the theology in it, but it's also, like, super personal, and I, I loved all of it. I am curious, as we kind of open that up to our listeners for them to hear a little bit about what's in the book. Um, and a little bit like they're standing around your kitchen island. I, why gift and grit is critical in relationships in the spiritual life for them. Yeah. yeah. Well, Katie, thank you for your, your words. Yeah, that's very, so very kind. kind of you. That, that's, I mean, that's exactly what we were mm. hoping for. So thank you for saying that. My 63-year-old mom read it in 36 hours. And so we joke because it is like it's so for young adults. But as we were writing it, I'm like, I'm just mm. talking to myself. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just talking to myself. I mean, because it's really it's lifelong, like you said. It's I mean, my my people always ask like the hardest jump was it from one you know zero kids to one or one to two or whatever i got asked that this weekend at a conference and i was like zero to one forever and always (laughs) the radical loss of freedom i was like we did double diapers that wasn't even as hard as those first like first year um and so but it really that grit that the grittiness of you know sacrifice suffering faith like all of that Dude, I feel like I'm in it again right now at 40 years old. And I, I told Swap, I'm like, this is the grittiest year I've ever had. Like, you know, po- like postpartum. And, you know, you do all these things and you're like, this is just, we need this forever. You know, we need this forever. I think even when we're in our, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, I'm going to be like, man, life is gritty. Like, it's all a gift, but it's still gritty. Mm-hmm. And, and we wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. And we get into that in the book, too. It's like, okay, well, then what are you living for? Yourself? Not a great plan. No. So, so I just, I, I wanted to throw that in there. Cause I think that like your, your face right now is my face, which is like, Oh, people, <laughs> it's not just, it's not just your teen and young adult years. Like you need this stuff forever. So it's better to figure it out early. Amen. Yeah. Well, and, and to that, the kid's question, we have a priest friend who, um, he did college ministry for years and years and years and years. And now he's in a parish and, and, uh, mm-hmm. and he, he kind of joked, he's like, you know, the first year of preaching in a parish, I'm like, you know, how do I, preach to a parish because this is this is new and he's like i tried to kind of angle it to to all these ages and it kind of didn't go so well and he's like then i just realized the second year i'm just gonna preach like i was preaching to college students mm-hmm. he's like and it was just off the charts everybody loved it and he's like what i realized is those issues are perennial like everybody is struggling and this gets back to the the, the title of the book like meaning what's my life about what's my where am i going this loneliness and i think for so many today life is like a story with no plot like you give your life meaning you kind of fabricate something you find something that you're passionate about manipulate but like what we long for really is meaning that's received um i love the line from then cardinal rotzinger that meaning that's self-made is no meaning at all like if i fabricate it if i concoct it if i manipulate it like it's as hollow as my 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 schemes and my plots are but what i want is to receive the gift of my life from on high and that I'm here for a purpose. I'm here for a reason that goes beyond myself. And, and then, and then, so that, that's part of the gift part, but then the, the, the purpose is to make my life a gift. And, 
you know, we all get enthusiastic about things like I want to study Greek or I want to play the piano or I want to be an elite athlete or Navy SEAL. But then it's like, okay, well, now you got <laughs> – if that's the end, what's the means to get there? Yeah. Oh, I don't know if I want to do that. And that's where <laughs> – Sainthood. I think I'll take a nap. Thank you. That's yes. where the grit piece comes nap. in. And I think for all of us – so many times, like I've been yeah. excited. I want to go I'll go on this retreat. I want to go all in. Mm -hmm. Ooh, but then I, I want to do this, this, and this. And that conflicts. Oh. And my, and friend, so, and my friends don't love that idea. Yeah. So now, you know. And I think virtue becomes heroic when it becomes insistent. Doesn't mean we'll never have a fall. But like, it's not just one time. Like, and with joy and peace and like, this is who I am. Freedom. You know, and, and that true freedom. Exactly. So that's where the book is coming from. That's where the title's come from. Is we were working with meaning and grit for a while. Like, yeah. Uh, and then what we do is real meaning is gift. Mm -hmm. And I need to make my life a gift. And it's going to take grit to do that. And gift and grit just sound fun. I <laughs> I love it when people are like gifting grits, man. Mm. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's <laughs> Every day. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. I really appreciated, um, I loved the the way that you guys wrote the book because because we've talked about writing together before and I think two people writing a book sometimes can be awkward at, as it is. <laughs> well, we're still married. Book. We're still married. So <laughs> there was a couple days where it was hard. <laughs> and I think the way you guys flowed out the book was just really beautiful. And you guys are such good storytellers too that like really draws you in um, and like invites you in before you punch them in the face with the truth, which I, <laughs> I love. Um, and I really like the... Right, like kind of the theological undertones of the fact that a lot of people in this world just don't have this biblical worldview um, or this philosophical um, idea of, of meaning in their life. And and they're just like ships without a sail and they just kind of get blown to and fro. And I, and I went through this in, in my life and then finding like something solid to be able to chew on was just so amazing. And just, I think of like gift and grit as almost like St. Thomas talks about the intellect and the will, right? Where like the intellect is like seeing the good. It's like, I got to know where I'm going first. And then I actually have to get my butt off the couch and start going that <laughs> way. Like that. And, uh, I and, and I like, yeah, right. Like there's only so many packs of Doritos you can eat before, like it's not helpful anymore. So, um, <laughs> but I, I think I really liked what you guys talked about with, uh, I think it's acedia, uh, which I never say that word right, but um, sloth is, is like the vice of our time is, is this idea that it's this escapism. It's this checking out. It's when things get hard, I bail because there's 800 other things to do. And we have these smartphones, which is instant gratification in our pocket all the time. Um, and, and we just can't say no to things to discipline ourselves for the greater good. And I think that that is, um, I think that's so important for our listeners to hear, but it's got to be presented like, you know, with some ice cream on top or else yeah. like, it's really, really hard to swallow. Totally. And I, think, I think you guys did a good job. We, we were talking with some young adults and, um, it was funny cause in that chapter and, and throughout the book, the two words that come up a lot, and this was something that, that we have shared with young adults a lot, but it kind of came together in this book was, um, what are you committed to and what are you convicted in? And I think that, that what we find with the, a lot of young adults is if I ask them, like, what are you convicted in? They, they don't know. And it's not their fault because they, one, I always tell I tell people, I'm like, parents of young adults, young adults, anybody, if you feel lost and overwhelmed and confused and not knowing what to do, like you're in good company because no one in the history of the world has ever been dealt the cards that we've been dealt, that they've been dealt. And it's just like, you're, you're really, you are playing with a deck that you've never seen before. And so conviction and commitment, we have this problem in the, in the 21st century called there's like so much to be like, what am I convicted in? It's like, I'm so overwhelmed with everything that's out there. There's so much, you know, information overload, you know, it's just, it, there's so much, but yet if I asked, you know, people, what are you convicted in? It's just a very blank, blank face. Cause it's like, there's just, I don't know. And then what are you committed to? We have a crisis of commitment in, in our culture. And it's because something better might come along or I don't want to be left out or I don't want to be forgotten. I don't want, you know, there's, there's all of the social media is just really done a number on what are you convicted in? What are you committed to? And then what is your definition of love? So those are the three, if you, when you read the book, it's like, we don't really talk about those three things and we do, but we don't, but the underpinning there is mm -hmm. okay. You got to start somewhere and you, you will be literally blown away with the wind. If you don't have some form of an answer for those three questions. Yeah. I, I like the word conviction. Cause it, 
to me, I guess in my mind, the connotation captures what's the mind and the heart. Like if I, if I have conviction, I'm not just paying like intellectual lip service. Like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm all in like, like Katie was saying. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I came across a quote, um, and this is not in the book, but, and this is, I don't know what, how to describe it, but tragic, damning. I, I mean, you know, and I've shared it people are like, Oh my gosh. But it basically went like this, that a younger generation is going to die alone without the spouse. They never married the kids. They never had and the God they never knew. And I'm like, Oh my, yeah, the, the, the younger generation will die alone without the spouse. They never married the kids. They never had and the God they never knew. And I really, and this is in the book. I mean, that, I really do think meaning is going to come from commitment. If I don't commit, I mean, we, we just want our options to be perpetually open. Like right. Life will pass you by and to oh, not yeah. commit is to make a decision mm-hmm. and it's to live a life devoid of meaning and purpose. And and I love what, you know, that, that word is, I mean, I hear a CD, I hear a Chadia, the Greek is Acadia. I mean, so yeah. we'll say it however pick, we want. Pick your favorite form of thought. No. But the Greek, we all pick our favorite form of The thought. Greek literally means lack of care. It's like an indifference. It's like a yeah. Eh, I mean, because we think of it as laziness, nah. and that's part of it. But like, it's you. You can like for the tradition. It's it's you know it's sadness at the difficulty of the good. And so I can, I can have this acedia, this acedia, this sadness, but also be like hyper busy and be the workaholic and work eighty hours a week or. I think for young people, worship at the altar of the mirror. And so it looks like I'm working really hard, but inside I am empty, I am barren, I am broken, I am sad. And it's because I, I, I'm I'm really spiritually lazy. I'm lazy about the highest things. Uh, and I, I just think you've got a culture. Like, what do you do? You can't sit there. Like, you kind of numb the pain, right? So you, you numb it with comfort food, and that might be food. It might be sex, drugs, alcohol, what have you, or... Or you might just entertain yourself to death, especially with the phone. That's mindless scrolling on the screen and distraction. Or you become workaholic. Yeah, I mean, so it's like you're, and, and it's like you know, you know, there's something off, but you don't want to be alone with your thoughts. Yep. And that's to me, like to me, this is this is our time, and, and it breaks my heart. And I guess students like, hey, I'm really strong with the faith. I'll, I'll ask, when was the last time you went outside at night and just looked up at the stars? Just just rekindled that awe and wonder you had as a mm-hmm. child, because. Hey, that's the that's the kind of natural seedbed again for faith to kind of yeah. where's the transcendent horizon yeah mm-hmm. i in the book you talked about at the root depression is a lack of meaning and i think that often we have this question of like where do i get joy or like how do i move past this deep sadness or anger or just resentment and it's like okay no like tuning into that meaning and opening up our reality that we are a gift to others. What does that gift look like? What uh, brings that purpose about in our lives? And I think that that's such a good reflection for us to sit in. I think your challenge of that, again, sloth can be a very full and noisy life. It can be filled with all sorts of things, whether that's work or just TV. Yeah, Yeah, it's just not the higher things. Yeah, exactly. It's just not the higher things. And therefore, to open ourselves up to that silence is going to be the cure that ends the deep sadness in our life, to be able to hear the voice of the Lord to invite us into that mission. I... You're totally good. Okay. I'm going to totally change. This yeah, that's what I was hoping that you would take it totally towards <laughs> dating. Totally. Yeah. Oh, so, you love it. Yeah. yeah so this it. is this is probably a weird thing for a 33 year old male who's married for 11 years <laughs> to be super excited about. But I want to talk to you guys about dating yeah. because yeah. It, is, it is so hard to give yeah. dating advice. And and mm. we, we made a video um, that. We had some uh, friend who teaches at a high, Catholic high school, and his he wanted to have us come speak to their class, and, and we couldn't make it out to Denver. Um, and so we were like, hey, just have them send us our questions, and, and we're going to make videos on it, right? And we'll send them back. And and one of them was on, like, high schoolers dating and going into college. And, like, I, like, I, I think there was some goodness in there, <laughs> but, like, I 100% wish we had... Your, had your book, book before we made that <laughs> video because I read it and I was like, I was like this, like we this. should just delete that video and just put a picture of this up there and be like, oh, hey, there so it sweet. is. Because and so, so uh, here's, the, here's the thing that I find really hard um, about dating. There's two things. One, we made a video on a dating one time and uh, someone was like, yeah, and someone commented they're like, yeah, that's easy for you to say. Like you hit the marriage jackpot. And I was <laughs> like, well, I don't disagree with that. Um, Right. It is. It's hard to talk about dating because um, I think 
a discerning marriage can look very different between high schoolers, between college students, and between young adults. And it's hard to, to bridge that gap and to give advice for everything. And the one thing that I love that you guys talked about was that there are two different defining the relationships. Um, because without, I didn't have that vocabulary before. And so I'd be like, well, you got to take it seriously, but not too seriously. But then, you know, you're just like, like, you got to get out there, but but don't get out there for everyone. And I'm like, oh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, she's in the middle. Yeah, so yeah, I'm just going to throw this to, to you guys. Like, how do you, yeah, how do you accompany young adults, uh, whether that's high school, college, or, or like a post-college in the dating scene? Yeah. This is where um, someone asked me the other day, like how long I've been doing what I've been doing. And I was like, that's a great question. And I'm 25 forever. Right. Like, you know, I, I'm like, oh my gosh, we used to always think we were like five years older than the college students. And we're like, we're double their score for sure. <laughs> double their score. So what, but the beauty of that is, is we have, you know, some of my friends be like, how do you know so much about all this? I was like, I, we have upwards of 15 to 20 years of, of living with and close to and around college students, young adults and our college students. I mean, I do a lot of high school ministry, high, high college ministry. And now our, our people that we walked with when I was a dorm director have like four or five kids. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, how is this happening? You know, like, um, and they are, you know, now they're the ones that are helping their friends find people, you know? So, I just, I think before we start, I'm, you know, it, it had dating culture in America right now in any country, literally it, you need a solid hour and a half to even get to all of it. And you still can't get to all of it. And even writing this book, it was trying to do a thorough job, but not make the whole book a dating book. Cause you know, dating is a part of this, but it is so unbelievably messy right now. I, I, I cannot begin to, that's why we are so passionate about this is because we had people help us find each other. And so we will do anything to help these young adults try to find each other, friendship and dating. Yeah. And it is, it is hardest. I think it's harder than it's ever been before. And you look at our grandparents, you know, my grandparents are 90 and I, I literally think they went, they like showed up at a Knights of Columbus dance and left with a spouse. Like, <laughs> I, I'm just like, how did you do this? Um, and, and when you start peeling some of that back, there's the, that was just a completely different time. And a lot of this human formation stuff was in place. And then also, I mean, my, my grandma went to a dance with a guy and ended up marrying his brother. I mean, that happened a lot. You know, it was like, oh, you're cute. Thanks for bringing me. Can I dance with your brother instead? You know, so I think that there's something really beautiful about they they were very open to dating. I mean, you could date four people in the same week. And now it's like, do not date four people in the same week. That's that's a terrible idea because everyone, you know, gets really stressed out. And so, so it's just interesting how quickly it changed in 90 years, in 100 years. It changed so quickly. And so, again, they're lost. I mean, I love giving talks to guys. Like, I, I love male ministry, says the 40-year-old mom. I love male doing male ministry because they are, they're like, what do we do? We are so... I feel like we've been like just thrown out in the deep and we're supposed to lead this thing. And they're so humble about it too. They're like, we don't know what to do. So this book, we, you know, we love the women, shout out to the women. But this book is literally like, please God, find the men, ha have this book, find our, our males out there. Um, so my girls, when girls buy it, I'm like, great, give it to a guy when you're done. You know what I mean? So, so we really, dating is really messy right now. And so thank you for bringing it up. And uh, we tried our best in the book and we, you know, we're trying our best to help with, with what's going on out there. But like you said, it, it is so messy. It's really hard. Yeah. Well, I think Drew, you nailed it on these two extremes, right? So it's like either you got the hookup culture, right? Or you've got times as like a, maybe a Catholic backlash in response to this. Like, we don't want to do that. So we'll just have boys on this side and girls on this <laughs> side. <laughs> One's going to talk or date. Leave or, room for the Holy Spirit. You know, and I, I honestly think one thing that is poison is the whole like soulmate thing and and, and and god's eternal knowledge like he knows what's going to happen he knows the plan but i just think it doesn't do us any psychological good because it puts <laughs> such pressure and it's like is she the one is he the one it's like let's just discern i mean like you know do they are they the kind of person you can see yourself ending up with do you like them do you find them attractive <laughs> like all this is all important right <laughs> yeah. um but, but yeah it's it's because it, on the one hand it's like you don't want a, a asking someone out to be equivalent to like a marriage proposal, which is so it sometimes happens, but then you'd also like casual you know, dating isn't in our vocabulary. We need to either. actually ask people out mm -hmm. and like acknowledge, Hey, 
uh, I'm not just trying to be friends. Like I actually want to like yeah, get yeah. to know you in a, in, a, in a romantic sense. Like we need to get intentions on the table and, and well, I know it's, we you know. said in the book, I remember, I, I think I put this in the book. I say this a lot is, uh, if, if you can't see yourself marrying the person you're dating, then you're not dating them. You're dating heartache. Like that is literally what you're dating. And I think that for a lot of young people, they're like, like when I say that publicly, they're like, Oh, you're God. You know, you can like see their face. They're like, Whoa. And I'm like, I'm not putting pressure on you. I'm just telling you, like, if we want to change, we have a whole chapter in the book on breakups. Because if there was one chapter that I should have put in emotional virtue, it was on breakups. Um, and But then someone was so cute. They're like, emotional virtue is the answer to what to do after a breakup. Like, gift and grit is the answer for what to do after a breakup. So I, the, the, the chapter is good, but we always say, if you want to change the way breakups go down, which can be the most horrible thing ever, then you have to change the way you date. And so in, in the, what you do in those dating situations and how this all plays out. And so it's been really fun to watch people read these chapters. And, and yes, it is. I always joke, please don't skip just to the can men, men and women be friends chapter or to the who do I date and how chapter um, because it built, the book really builds on itself. Um, and so, yeah, it, that was always really hard. We knew people were going to skip right to that chapter. Yeah. You know, one thing that I think is, I mean, we always common formation we met here at the college and uh like dr edwards three was a mentor to both of us mm -hmm. and a kind of common class that was kind of a common backdrop that built really our friendship and then even our dating our marriage and things like that and yeah i don't know i mean it, it's uh i hope it's not far-fetched but like we have discussion questions in the back of this book and i think your virtue book has done the same thing mm -hmm. i think if groups of people are reading this together and they're like i want my friendships to look like this i want my friends with the opposite sex look like this i want something like this and it, i mean that is a common common, language. common vocabulary mm -hmm. common background that's going to make it easier to facilitate these things yeah um that's not going to happen also, everywhere but i always, we always tell people blame us <laughs> like like if, if you want to say something to a friend be like gosh it was crazy this chick and this guy <laughs> on page 45 what do you think of that you know like like are they love you know and, and i always tell people when you're <laughs> dating someone bring stuff up and be like, yeah, I can't, what are your thoughts on 45 yeah. and 62? And don't answer for them. Let them answer because you will find out so much about where they're at yeah. by asking a question, and seeing how they react to things that we've said. And we we're big, we're big boys and big girls. Like we, you can blame us. You can throw us under the bus. We will be fine. You know, like you can do whatever you need to do to get this conversation out there, especially if you're in a, a relationship that you're like, I don't know if we need to be moving forward, moving backwards, yeah. this friendship. I don't know if we're really on the same page. I want to be on the same page. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. uh, we don't mind being blamed. Well, I we so don't mind being blamed at all. If a person's like, yeah, I want this. And they're a person they're seriously dating is like, are we at the next level? How they react to that, I think tells you something. Like, do for, they for sure. want the same thing? Are they, are they as yeah, equally exactly yoked right. and committed to the, cause we've all been those sports like, yeah, they're in it, but not as much as I am. Oh, we versa. get this question all the time. You know, like, I don't want to drag my significant other to heaven. Yeah. I'm like, no. It's like, if you're feeling you like that now. You do not want to drag your significant other to heaven. You need them to yeah. lead you yeah. in your own way. Don't expect that to change just because yeah. you. Yeah. Sometimes mm -hmm. the Lord does not amazing mm -hmm. thing. But you can't oh. bank on that. you got to choose them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, there's so much. I I think that that like what is the relationship you're in and projecting that forward. I will forever be grateful if the Holy Spirit worked our marriage proposal that Drew ended up being in front of a painting of St. Joseph. And as he asked me to be the mother of his children, this reality that that's the invitation of marriage as well. Like, is this somebody that you want to be a parent to your children? Like, that's going to be a huge part of this equation, God willing. I uh, And so that element of it, really looking like, is this the person you want to marry? Is this the person you want to be the mom or dad of your kids? Um, I really like in today's culture where it's, it's blurry, and Drew mentioned this, that defining the relationship, I... And that women can kind of do that first defining of the relationship, I think was a beautiful uh, invitation with the expectation. I don't know if you can explain that. Yeah. I'm going to, yeah, somebody's yeah, going to listen talk, to that out yeah, of, yeah, out of yeah. context. So I, go ahead. I will yes, turn please, that back. Yes, explain that, please. Explain yeah. That. No, it's a great. That's a really great. Um, so what we were trying to, we get this question a lot um, is 
Okay. So a lot of women are like, I want to be pursued. I'm like, who doesn't? Um, like, you know, we, women want to be pursued. That's part of our, we're receivers initiators. This is all TOB 101, right? Like, and there's something really, really beautiful about being pursued. That said in 2023, I think a lot of women want to like be at a dance and stand along the wall and just look really cute and be like, somebody pick me. You know what I mean? And what we're, what we're trying to say is it's okay to leave the wall and to go out into the party or into the dance or into the social or into the thing and mingle and drop every hint in the entire book that you are interested in someone to the point where you might even want to say, Hey, like I have really loved getting to know you like in our friend groups, like I've loved getting to know you. Would you want to grab dinner sometime or go to coffee or something? It's not having a woman go up and be like, will you date me? Cause I would just really like to date you. You know what I mean? It's just, it's again, it's, we, we wrestled with this for yeah. years. Cause we were like, do we like, how do we, I know these women don't want to, and you know, to make the invite or even make the ask. And we're not saying that they need to go up and be like, please date me, but it's okay to say, Hey, like, I would love to get to know you better. Um, and, and just plant that very large neon sign that says, I am interested in you. And, and, and I, I remember asking Andy, I'm like, what if they've like left every hint and like said, I'd love to get together and all this stuff. And the guy still doesn't respond. And as a woman, I'm like, what do we do? And Andy goes, then he's not interested. <laughs> and I'm like, shut up. That's me. Like, no, you try. I mean, we're dense, uh, but we're not that dense. Right? Yeah. Men are, men are dense, right. I, so, so this, like, we're just trying to make everybody like everybody take a deep breath. Yes. We are, we are no longer in the porch sitting courting, ask your dad to go anywhere season of, you know, history. So because we're not there anymore, and because we have this other phenomenon, which I talked about a lot in Emotional Virtue, and, and we talked about a lot in Gift and Grit, of this idea of like, there are people on their phones saying the same thing to you to three other people, and you might think that you're about to get married, and he or she just said that actually to three different people. And you talk about, we already have identity crises, and we already have like feeling your worth and feeling lack of worth. And I mean, this is so unbelievably messy to sort this all out and then to put yourself out there and then to be rejected, to be, you know, ah, yeah, 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 blah, 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 blah. I mean, this is why we sometimes are just like, Lord, can we pick a different topic? You know, and, um, but, but I, I say this all the time, you guys, and I know you feel this too. Someone told me one time, they're like, you're so passionate and I, about this. And I was like, yes. And this person looked at me and said, yeah, I heard a long time ago, show me your misery. I'll show you your ministry. And my misery is watching people. I don't care if you're young adults. I was at this conference this weekend and we have 40, 50, 60, 70 year olds who are divorced and widowed trying to date again in a Catholic way. So it's every age. It's every age trying to go back and get back into the game called gift and grit. I know my life is a gift. I want to make my life a gift. I know that this is all real. I have the grit to do it, but the grittiness of life for a lot of young adults right now is being rejected, picking yourself back up, being an introvert and trying to go to a party, not just going to your cubicle, not just going to happy hour and drinking with your coworkers, like having the grit to say, I got to do this differently because I want my marriage, God willing to look differently. I want, I want this next relationship to look different because I did it this way. And now I want to see what God wants for me. So it yeah. is so messy and I have such a heart for it. And Swaf has such a heart for it. And that's why we were so meticulous in how to write this book. Yeah. And we were so picky we had the editors come through and we were like, nope, we know we're right. Like we know that this needs to be, and they were like, oh, we get it now. We get what you're trying to do. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's, it's very gentle because people have been hurt yeah. and people have been raised with wounds and it's very, very messy. So, so yeah, the whole two DTRs, one is defining the relationship. Like, Hey, could there be something here? And then, Hey, I think we might be called to like, see what God wants. And maybe this is the person I'm supposed to marry. Those are two very different. Hey, do you want to have coffee and get married? Two different. <laughs> so, yeah. A little different. <laughs> well, I mean, the danger, you know, we, we don't want to enable the guys to be lazy and just not, right? right. So, so we were very kind of, but like that initial showing of interest, we mm -hmm. kind of were like, look, either side, just get that. Because we, we've seen, <laughs> Roll them all. we've seen, especially honestly, women, mm -hmm. incredible women, just wonderful people go through four years of college and like literally never go on a date. And we're like, what is, 
what is, what is wrong happening? With the world? So part of it, just let, let's let's get things going because this is <laughs> this, we're missing things here. And so whoever shows the initial showing of interest, you know, the dropping the hanky. The, oh like, yeah, because I, 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 I think we're too pierced. Like, well, I the guy's got to do everything. It's like, so no, much. it's okay for the woman to kind of get the ball rolling. Mm. We do think. I mean, we kind of that the guy should make the when when you're going to commit to someone and mm. say, I want to commit to you. And and honestly, from the one to the second, from the initial showing of interest to the kind of either commitment or you're going to back off. Like, it doesn't have to be that long. I mean, like it could be a couple of weeks, a month maybe, but you don't want to yeah. drag that on forever. Um, but we, you know, we, we ideally, I think the guy puts himself out there on that second stage and says, you know, I want to, I want to commit to you. Yeah. Um, and that's not a marriage proposal yet, no, but it is something more serious than I'd like to get to know you better. The word that floats around in this conversation and you can hear it from us and you can hear it is risk. Cause terrified to take the risk because of rejection and, and lack, you know, so commitment, conviction, what's your definition of love? Are you willing to take the risk? This is all where the date, this is why the dating culture is honestly constipated. It's completely constipated because everything is just like, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to do nothing. I'm just going to play video games and I'm just going to work out. And the girls are like, I'm just going to look at social media and babies. I'm just going to hate my life. You know what I mean? Like everyone's just like, I don't know what to do. Therefore I am going to just shut down, shut my heart off. And I'm just going to sit over here. And, and again, I, when I give, when I do young adult ministry, I'm like, Hey, guess what? You're bitter. You're mad. You're angry. I respect it. Like, I'm not coming up here to tell you. I'm, I'm literally standing here because I am kind of bitter and angry for you. Yeah. Like, like, I, like I honestly, I'm ticked. And, and often the older, the more jaded. Yeah, because they've tried doing all the things. And so and it, it's a really messy thing, but it's also worth the fight. And I tell them it's worth the work. Like, it's worth it. It just yeah. is really hard. And we don't pretend for a minute to say that it's not hard. So everyone's listening to us right now. Yeah. We're with you. Yeah. Like, we're with you. And that's why we wrote the book is because you need to not feel like you're alone. And I think that even translates into our friends. And I think that you guys did a really good job of outlining virtuous friends. And I'm not going to lie. When I read it at first, I was like, I don't have to define the relationship as a virtuous friendship with like, we're both traveling towards the Lord. Like, and I was like, oh no. And then you got into like why we need that. And how that allows for fraternal correction in a way that isn't awkward and isn't judgmental and isn't. And I was like, oh, yes, we need to define our relationships. And it all comes down to this, like the risk. It's the risk in friendship. It's the risk in relationships that are more of a romantic. It, it just is this human eye formation that we need. Huh? Uh, we have a book for that. Um, <laughs> but this reality of... How do I take the risk to enter in to an awkward potential to therefore facilitate a beauty and a good and to step out in that um, and timeline of this recording? I, I think recent readings have just like been highlighting the fraternal correction and the Lord's call of like, do not heart in your heart. And so in this, as we've been hurt in relationships, friendships, dating relationships, our own marriages, all of the things that the Lord invites us to not harden our hearts. And I think that your call, we talked a little bit about sloth, but just to echo one of the things that you said in the book was this idea that sin and silence cannot really coexist. That once we enter into a place of silence and prayer, we're going to be strengthened for this journey of risk. And I think that you do a wonderful job of outlining that invitation for prayer, for a deeper uh, foundation of who we are that allows us to go out and to take these risks and all of these relationships ultimately in our lives. Um, I don't know. Any more thoughts on that? Yeah, we prayed about it a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Because we, you know, when we started writing the book, we actually came up with 10 questions we get asked all the time. That was, that's how the book was, was formed. And then kind of sorting through, you know, how, because we give... We say the same stuff all the time. I said we were joking about like the the apostles. We love the chosen and stuff, you know. And it's like when they were writing the gospels, they're like they heard the dude say it sixteen thousand times. Like you know what I mean? Like it's so great because you know when you when you have mentors and stuff, you know. And we have you know we have people that at in Italy they could finish our sentence. They knew like and now they give the same advice because they're like 
Mm-hmm. Ooh, this tool works. I heard this Wofford say it, you know? And that's what, when we talked about this book, we kept talking about, this sounds hilarious, but sex and prayer, sex and prayer, sex and prayer. Like those were like the two that it seemed like if you can get chat, if you get chastity and like how, like one of the chapters is what does sex have to do with the spiritual life? And it was really like, if you can figure out where that fits, love, sex, you know, all of the, the chastity, that, that whole piece if you can figure that that out and figure the prayer piece out, you're cooking with gas. And the problem is, is our world is those two are really tricky for the world, for, for your typical average Catholic. Those two are the hard ones because a lot of young adults come up to me and be like, yeah, like everyone just says pray about it. I don't know how to pray. I have no clue what to do with that, you know, and they feel discouraged because it's almost like. You know, it's like asking someone to do something that they don't. It's like, go speak French. It's like, I don't know how. Like, I don't know how. Yeah, I mean, they're they're sincere. Like, what do you mean by that phrase, pray? Do you just mean say some Hail Marys? Do you mean, uh, and this is not to take anything away from things like the rosary or or time-tested devotions, of course. But I I think back to that letter Mother Teresa wrote to her sister. Well, she says, these are missionaries of charity. (laughs) They own everything they have is in a bag. I, I fear that some of you do not know Jesus. And I've shared this with theology majors. Like we have like 200 theology majors, and, and they're amazing. They're wonderful. But you know, there's a danger that you might be a theology major. You might be on to grad school, but do you know Jesus? Or can and, you just and, talk about it? And even in, I mean, I mean the, like, you know, obviously the Mass is the highest prayer. It's the prayer of Christ. We enter it as the body of Christ. But there's a sense in which that's the consummation. And we, you know, I too hit the marriage jackpot. But we have a strange <laughs> marriage if we just consummated and didn't talk, right? I mean, so if you're going to make that consummation all the more fruitful in your life, there's got to be that heart to heart conversation. And I, I, some people are great at it, but it has to be a priority because I think it, it's so easy, even for serious Catholics, to just bypass that and do the right things, check the boxes and bypass them. And I think that's why a lot of them come to us. It's like, I feel like I'm doing all the things I'm doing all the things, but something is still amiss. And that's where that mental prayer, you know, that really coming to the Lord and, you know, even be, you taking that bitterness to him, Healing. taking yeah. that, you know, I was in confession years ago and um, I love telling the story. I was in confession years ago and this priest, I was like, given this confession and I thought it was really good. And he stops me in the middle of it. Right. And he's like, he's a friend. He's like, Sarah, 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 real quick. Um, you do know that like God doesn't love you because you're good and you're perfect. He loves you because he's good and he's perfect. And his love for you doesn't go up or down based on your performance. Like you're aware of that. Right. And I was like, oh, absolutely. And then I cried for like two hours, like in the, like went to adoration, cried for like two hours. And I was like, I was converted. Like I was, you know, I mean, I, I, I knew the Lord and it was really beautiful. It was just that moment in my life where I was like, wow. And I tell people the Lord doesn't expect you to come to him put together. He expects you to come to him messy. Like he isn't sitting up there with like a grade, like looking good today, Sarah, you know, like, I mean, he's not, you know, it's just not like that for him. And we as humans think of his love in a human, human way. So it's really hard for humans to be like, wait, I don't have to like earn your love. I don't have to be enough. I don't have to, I can like suck and come in here and yell at you and you're not going to hate me. Like you're not going to judge me. You're not going to look. And some of my truest prayers and truest forms have been going into adoration, going before the Lord and being like, what the what Lord, like what, what, you know, like, I mean, I, I've had a couple of those conversations this year, you know, like, just like, I am trying to do your will. Like what I am like, you know, and so I think when, when, when young adults and, and even adults hear us speak like that, like this is the relationship God wants with you. He doesn't want a fake relationship just as much as you don't want a fake relationship with anyone else. Like he gives you, free will. Like, he, he's pursuing you, but you, you're the one that really has to answer the the call of his, his heart, you know? And, and so I think that when we explained all that in the book, I, I think that it was really good for some people to kind of say, Oh, like I, I did, I missed that. Like the way I missed it growing up, I missed, I, I was a cradle Catholic. I missed a lot of the, the formation and so did our parents, and, you know, and, and it's no one's fault. It's like, we, you only can, you can only, you only have what you've been given. So that's why I think, that, you know, again, jumping into this and, and really exploring um, this whole uh, human formation part, but also this, like, what is a prayer life? And I desperately need one. 
Um, and so, and that's why we wrote that chapter and knowing that this is really where the rubber hits the road. Yeah. And how does that transform our friendship and our relationships? Amen. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Oh. Uh, I just want to pick your guys' brains forever. <laughs> this is so fruitful. Hey, so maybe part we'll two, man. Yeah, you guys are uh, awesome. Yeah, you guys. Right. And also, to be honest, like, we are so grateful that you read the book because it means so much to us when people, like, when they refer to parts we wrote, we're like, Oh, you read that. <laughs> oh, like, like, it helped. Like, praise God. Because you really do. You put all you pour your life into it. You pour your heart into it. You talk about it. Yeah. You argue about it. You, you it's almost like a recipe, like you're cooking like a fine meal and you cook it like six or seven times. I think we had at least seven versions of the book that we read through, reread yeah. through, messed around, you know, moved and so it's almost like cooking you something and then having someone eat it and go, this doesn't suck. This is really good. Like I really got something out of this, you know? So we're really honored that you had, that you read it and had us on. Yeah. We really appreciate it. It's super fun to talk to you guys. So good. All right. Absolutely. Let's, if you guys have like three minutes, we'll do oh, the, yeah. lightning the, round. the new lightning round questions. Yeah, you Cause guys... you guys answered our old lightning round questions. Oh, so we have to get new right. questions round just two. for you guys. Yeah. All right. First one. Uh, what is your favorite ascetical practice? Ooh, I can't spell ascetical, but <laughs> not a requirement. You know this. You first. I have to think. Uh, I think I'm kind of boring, but I think. <laughs> no, you're not. Yeah, yeah, you are. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I think fasting from from food. I, now, fasting from sleep. I'm not. Oh, <laughs> I, I just can't. Not that <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I think. I think. Uh, fasting yeah. i too am very bad at these things uh like bad meaning like i i i'm a creature of comfort so it's really good for me um i don't like fasting but i also at one time i tried cold showers for a while and <laughs> it ranks up there with hair shirt um you know what i mean that's like, up there with loss of sleep right? <laughs> yeah. or I, I know some kids i'd rather college, fast than cold showers. i know i'm cutting college students i know some college students that step on slept on the floor for lint and i was like yeah. i I don't think I'd be able to move. I'm like, I would be out as a mother if you put me on the floor for 40 days. <laughs> I'd be... no, real, real quick, uh, we, have, we have a men's group. Um, and for Lent, we each picked a week that we would choose the ascetical practice for the other men. And so I, so I, so I chose, oh I chose cold, cold showers for our men. And one of the guys looked at me and he was like, bro. And I was like, what? He goes, I would rather fast for 48 hours than take a cold shower for a week. <laughs> so sure enough, guess, guess what he picked for his week? 48 hour fast. <laughs> <laughs> so, goes around, comes I, around. All right. Okay, but I also order for you. Imposing his love language upon you. Imposing his love language, yeah, exactly. That's right. Okay. Uh, so not a lightning round, but also going to add this in that my spiritual director, who's like hugely aesthetical in their like spirituality. I was like, I'm just not good at it. How have you been my spiritual director for 10 years? And I don't know how to do like fetishism. And he was like, Katie, your whole life is asceticism. <laughs> like, you're a true. mom. Like I have to add this in. I and I was, when you were like, yeah. I'm trying to think, right I'm there. like, give birth, yeah. have a newborn, yeah. nurse <laughs> that child. Yeah. So yeah. you got a list. I know. Um, well, I told okay. the kid, the college students are like, have you guys ever done Exodus 90? And we're like, our life is Exodus 90. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we try never it. get to watch TV yeah. or do any of the things that we want 18 to do. Years. Well, yeah, oh, seriously, yeah. no, there's a part of that. I'm all for it. It's like, <laughs> is this my pride that wants to do it? Because I might destroy my family if I'm just ready. Yes, right? fact. <laughs> but like, you're not a nice person on Exodus. Mm. Anyway, you have, to be, you have to be nice and do Exodus yes. 90. Joyful. And That's true. So. <laughs> Great question. That was a great question. So back to the lightning round. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. Question number two is <laughs> uh, best life hack for growth in the spiritual life. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. We're not good at the lightning part. I didn't, I didn't say this would be that easy. For me, like with anything that like I need to make a priority that I'm having trouble making a priority is if I can connect it to something that I'm definitely going to do. So, um, yeah. Like for example, I you know, and I haven't been perfect on this, but like I, I, I like my, my temptation in prayer is gonna be like just to read instead. I'm gonna I'm gonna pray with the Bible. You know, you're just <laughs> doing Bible study. Like you just <laughs> right? um, yep. But if I like commit to okay, I'm going to, you know, read X amount of scripture in adoration or at the church, like that's gonna get me there and, mm -hmm. and I'll because I wanna do that, I'll get you know and of course I wanna pray. We all wanna pray. But like there's just yeah there's some things where it just helps for me to associate this with that. Mm -hmm. Cause I know I'm going to do that and I need to do this. So we'll put them together 
and that tends to make them happen for me. Yeah. Our 16 year old put his prayer books on his gaming chair and he won't game unless he's prayed. And I was like, that, that, that's what we're talking about here. But, um, but I, I think for me, to be honest, okay, so I'm a, um, silence is great, but I also love like music and podcasts and things like that. And so I, I would be really, so life hack is be careful not to just fill the space, you know, like, like silence is really good. So is podcasts and things. So I have like a little thing in the morning where I don't open my phone until I've prayed. Um, like I have like a, so I think Andy's right. You know, you almost have to have like a, if I, we work as human beings with rewards and reprimands, we just do. And it's just, and so like, I think a, a, a spiritual hack is how do I create that almost like athlete slash, um, you know, you're rewarded with this. And, you, you know, so like my girls, I used, when I was an RD, I used to plan their schedule for them. And I used to always give them a bedtime based on their, cause college students are notorious. Like it's four. I don't know how it became 4 AM. I'm like friends. So I would, and if they made their bedtime every, you know, like I told them, I'm like Monday through Friday, if you do your bedtime, you get to reward yourself with whatever you want on Saturday or whatever. And they were like, man, I was so, I was so much better at it. So I would say having those rewards and reprimands. And then also, um, I am a firm believer in what I call holy smoke breaks. So I don't actually smoke, but I walk out every once in a while. Like I just walk outside or I like, I just, I literally just go outside because I need like, I need a minute to recalibrate, especially in a busy, like if you, if you're like a full-time working person or you're a priest or you're religious or you're a parent or you're single and you're in a job, you just need to like step away for a minute. And, and so I do these little five minute Holy smoke breaks and my kids now know, like, I'll be like, I'll be right back. And they're like, she's smoke breaking. Like, mm. she's, you know, cause like they know that I just had to get outside. And that has been so fruitful for my prayer life is just, again, five minutes here, five minutes there quiet. Okay. What am I doing in my life? Jesus, like help me reset, you know, like reset the deck, you know? So that's been really what, what you guys described reminds me of the book Atomic Habits, which for our listeners, if you haven't read that, just put Catholic Atomic Habits and just <laughs> use that for your prayer life. Yes. We should write yeah. a book on that if I didn't get thrown in jail for copywriting. It'd be awesome. Yeah, <laughs> but um, it's, you're exactly right. Well, even the grit book that they wrote, the, the grit book, she, you yeah. know, it's a secular book. Yeah, Angela Duckworth. yeah it's yeah, like you just got to baptize good. those books. Just yep. put them no, in seriously. Water. Yep. Yeah, totally. Yep. Uh, all right. Best recommendation for date ideas for you get two options for like dating couples and for married couples. Mm. Oh. Yep, date ideas. Let's hear it. Oh, I love it. Oh, I know one of our favorite. Well, yeah. we're really competitive, shocking. Um, and so one of our favorite date nights is to go to like a Dave and Buster's and play arcade games. And loser definitely win or get something, loser get something. And we love we love playing trivia at like Buffalo Wild Wings. Like we, we love that kind of stuff. Things that are for your listeners, dating or not. Well, probably more married. There's a big difference between a marriage meeting and a date night. I used to bring my planner to, to our date night. Kills the mood, right? So <laughs> so we try to do stuff that's like really fun for a date night or go to dinner and try not to like make it a meeting, if that makes sense. Um, so we like doing things that are active, like putt putt and so we, so we're big fans of like doing something together because we talk anyway throughout it. Yeah. Um, or yeah, so we don't really go to movies and stuff because we're like, oh, we need time together. Um, but we love like physical like competition or like trivia and competition. But that could be for dating or yeah, I think those those translate. Yeah, I think it's um, you know we always default to like dinner, right? But it's like okay, you got any other ideas? Right? <laughs> um, I, I think especially like. It depends on what stage we're talking, but it, it, it's it's when you have something to do. Um, I mean, so dinner's great, but it's also pretty intimate because you're just like staring at each other, right? Uh, a movie <laughs> with like, your planner. A movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A movie might be great, but it's kind of passive, right? We're just like, you know, yeah. unless we're going to go talk about the movie, uh, but to have like something to do, um, mm -hmm. whether it's, I mean, maybe it's go to a baseball game or. Mm -hmm. You know, we, um, we've got some, uh, well, a couple that we've been working with and they just had their two year anniversary and he, he planned this like picnic in this like uh, kind of rural area, like beautiful, like not very far, but like, um, yeah, like, I, it, like I mean, it, yeah, like finger foods and wine. And they just sat out and looked over this yeah, hill and, and so it was like, okay. So if you, if you're five love language fans, which I am, um, you can take, you can take the quiz and you're like, oh, I knew what I was or whatever. But when you read the book 
it changes everything. And so and I, we both ranked like pretty high on physical touch, quality time. You know, I love the giving and receiving gifts, like the gift of presence, which actually isn't TS, it's CE, like I thought of you. Um, didn't know that till I read the book. I was like, I'm not gifts. I'm like, well, I love shopping for people, but like, and so anyway, but the, in the quality time one, there's a subset. You're either quality time or quality activity. He's quality time. He can sit on the couch and talk for 16 hours and he would be so happy. <laughs> I'm like, can we move it to the porch with wine? Like, <laughs> like, can we move it to the field with charcuterie? You know what I mean? Like, so, so knowing your, yeah. knowing your significant other one's um, love language is really great too, because there you could add in little things that make it better for them. If that makes sense, like makes it more like Andy's like, why are we driving for this? We could talk on the porch. And I'm like, but we're doing this, you know? So anyway, you just you, you got to know which one, which one. Yeah, you the are. challenge is always being creative, but not breaking the bank. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Andy's like, I did like, this. I'm like, how much was that? Like, I'm more the free spirit. <laughs> Sarah's the more the, the frugal one. And, um, and so it's like, I'm the you know, nerd. So if I like go over the top, she's like, what are you? Thinking? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Yeah, but 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 whatever happens, do it. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Do it. It's like the what's the best Bible translation? The one that you you read. read, What's the best way to pray? Way you pray best. That's the the idea for miracles. The The one one you you actually do. (laughs) It's fact. Fact. Uh last question. Where can people find out more about you, what you have going on? I yeah, just life. Yeah. In the book. Super the easy. Book. We, we made, we made it the swafford's.com like one stop shop. Cause it was getting to the point where there was a lot and it's so much nicer to just have one website. So you can find like gift and grit there. You can find all the books in our store. We love it when they order it from us so we can sign it for them and like put their name on it. Um, Amazon doesn't let us sit their place and do that. So anyway, so we love that they make great gifts. A lot of our books make great gifts, which is fun. Um, and then also we have a pilgrimage coming up to Rome. I know we were with you guys on the, what we believe, uh, last year and we're doing Rome and Assisi and Capri and like oh, Amafi Pompeii. So it's young adults, young at heart, whoever wants to come, but it's going to be next summer, 2024 in August. Um, so we're announcing all that and that's all on the website too. That's all really fun. So we love, okay. Shout out to your young adult crowd. Um, pilgrimage is a great place to meet people. So <laughs> get all your friends and come be involved because I, I have promised the girls. I'm like, I'm going to find at least 15 single men to go on this. Re- I, I, like my one goal is to find a bunch of guys to go on this, <laughs> on this pilgrimage. So anyway, uh, the mean, the meet and meet and greet Rome, hang out, mingle. Meet your spouse at our house. <laughs> <or> <laughs> On pilgrimage. Yeah, exactly. So. Perfect. The first DTR can be going to get gelato. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I really loved our time on this trip. Would you yeah. like to go get gelato for the 60th time, but with me? That's yeah. right. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we eat gelato every day, sometimes multiple times. Getting gelato is a great day that day. <laughs> yeah. Just say it. Just say it. <laughs> oh, it has been so good to have you guys on the show. We will put all the links down below of where they can find that website, the book all of the social media. I, and yes, thank you. Thank you for the blood, sweat, and tears that went into this and all the people that it will serve. Yeah. Oh, we pray it helps in any way. We just wanted people to know they're not alone and they're not crazy. Amen. Like they're not crazy. Thanks so much for having us and thanks for all that you do. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are awesome. We are not organized enough to, to do a podcast. We love being on other people's (laughs) podcasts. Everyone's like, do it. And we're like, no, like these no. beautiful people do all the editing and all the beautiful. So you yeah. have us on anytime. No, this is good. You you guys read the books. We'll do the podcast. Deal. Deal. Perfect. Deal. Match made in heaven. Yeah. Right. Awesome. awesome. Uh, God yes, bless for, you guys. Thank you guys. For all of our listeners, thank you for joining in. Um, tune in next time. We're praying for you and God bless.